Jeffrey with Slice of Sci-Fi. A very special report for you today. I am with Thomas Jane and Tim Bradstreet of Raw Studios. We're going to learn all about Raw Studios today. Thomas, I imagine most of the women know you from HBO's Hung. Most of the guys know you from The Punisher. <laughs> and you right. travel in cool circles. You are an uh, artist, illustrator, comic guru. Legend in your own hand, is that true? Been around for a little while, yeah, sure. A guru, I don't know, but yeah. You feeling that way? Uh, well, anymore, the older I get, definitely. So what attracted you to work with him? Well, we, uh, it's kind of a long story, but we met actually uh, doing uh, the posters for uh, The Punisher. And, uh, you know, we, we started a conversation that's still going on, you know, today. It was one of those, kind of one of those... Uh, one of those meetings where you, you just meet people and it's like, oh yeah, we're, we're, we're friends. You know, we'll be friends forever. Yeah, we pretty much, we felt, I think it was like, a, a, you know, when you, when you run into someone like that, you feel like you've known them, you know, for yeah. a long time. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's, that's what it was. And like Tom said, it's just still going on. Actually, it was, it was, it was very near to love at first sight, but uh, <laughs> bit of it wasn't, but it wasn't at all. <laughs> Past yeah. life. Kind of thing. Past life, kind possibly, of possibly. I don't know. We could have both been British and, you know, kicked out of the country at one time, threatened to be hung. I don't know. Ooh, that was terrible. Go ahead. <laughs> hung, yeah, I heard that. <clears throat> so was it a, um, was it an artistic uh, appreciation or was it a genuine love for comics that brought you two together? Yeah, I mean, we both kind of have the same sort of sensibility and we like the same stuff and have the same concepts about sort of what we feel is uh, what turns us on, you know, and, and that boils down to uh, basically elevated genre is what we base our company on. It do, we love science fiction, obviously, and we love uh, the graphic novel medium, um, and we love movies. Mm -hmm. So we started Raw Studios b with one book called Bad Planet, which is our flagship book, which we're still working on now. We're working on part two now. Um, and uh, you know, we, I've, you know, as a kid, was really inspired by movies like Alien and 2001. I think those were probably the two most influential films um, of my childhood. And then, of course, Tim's a ens veritable encyclopedia on film. You know, he, he really knows his stuff in that department, especially composers and, you know, just everything. Costume designers and production designers and... Tim and I did our first movie called Dark Country for uh, Sony DVD. Um, and Tim was basically the production designer, although I don't think he was credited as such, but he was our, our production designer on that film. And, and, uh, and that was kind of our film school, you know, for, it was a Sony DVD project, but it w that was a Raw Studios film, you know. We got to use all of, we got Bernie Wrightson to help design the character designs. And, you know, and, and for me, that was the big learning experience that, uh, that I needed to to l learn my way around uh, a movie camera and, and a movie crew and and start to try to put our vision of, of onto the screen um, and then of course the comic book stuff is you know basically an extension of of that and uh, and our storytelling sort of sensibility you know the artists that we use we are very particular about the artists that uh, that we use in our books and and of course the writers I mean you know it's it's sort of it's just what is it it's sort of a it's very much like casting a film if you cast a film right and you ha you get the right ensemble together they're yeah. going to even if maybe the screenplay even if the writing isn't quite there that company will pull it together so it's very much about finding the right artist for the right look for the right project mm -hmm. and and it's like Tom says you know they they kind of they they're kind of offshoots of each other you know they're interchangeable whether it's comics or film we kind of have the same you know kind of kind of way of going about it we have the same kind of process yeah so the the production paradigm is is very much the same regardless of the distribution medium you still go through the same it's research production process, and, and storytelling yeah. process oh yeah casting, it, all those it really is I mean it's storytelling and you know and when you get a group of guys together to tell stories um, magic things happen, mm -hmm. and you're right. And deciding who goes where is the big, uh, and, and I, that's really what I learned on Dark Country too. You know, it's not only who's in front of the screen, but it's who's behind the screen. It's who you cast and all the different key roles. That's going to determine what kind of stuff that you, you know, uh, that, that you get out of w of what you 
of what you put in. In so. a way, we're, we're like general man. It's, it's like a ball club. It's like putting together a winning ball club, and, mm -hmm. and we're the general manager. So you have to make the right call on, on the personalities you bring into the project mm -hmm. um, and, and you know, what their talents are. And you, know, you want to find that magical medium where everything mm -hmm. comes together. That's, I mean, w even if you don't capture lightning in a bottle you know, with, with what you put out, um, if you have that, uh, that kind of team together, the process of it is, it, you know you're m doing good work regardless of whether everyone likes it or not. Right. And, uh, and that's all we really aspire to do is do work we're proud of. Yeah, yeah. So Raw Studios, uh, this is, th is created just post Punisher? Yeah, I suppose so. Yeah, just, yeah, just yeah, yeah. Well, heck, a couple, couple, yeah. Formed at the at the sure at the, at the tail end of the the, the production schedule uh, of what was it the publicity <coughs> schedule? Yeah, yeah. We were down. I was down in San Diego doing press for uh, at the end of my press tour for the Punisher, and Tim and I hooked up at the W Hotel, and I pitched him this crazy idea for Bad Planet, which was this epic uh, alien. Uh, s space opera that took place, you know, in different galaxies and different planets, and there were uh, massive alien invasions. There was Wave One and then Wave Two, and and it was this massive story. And of course, you know, it, it was it was designed to be a graphic novel. And I, Tim and I, kind of worked out the kinks at the W Hotel over about a four-hour period. And uh, then Tim suggested I go to Steve Niles, who um, was in a punk band in Washington, D.C. that I used to buy the records for. I didn't know that until I met him. But it was, uh, just to give you an example of how small this world is, um, I used to buy Steve's punk, punk records in this band he was in called Grey Matter. And Steve and I hit it off, and, we, and he showed me the ropes of how to do a, a script for a comic book. And uh, Steve helped me outline the book, and he was you know, really there to, to help me um, keep me on the right track and and that was you know it was great it was trial by fire and Tim was there to you know d direct he basically production designed the whole book as well as inked the whole the whole first the whole first uh, series but Tim was there to find me ar find the right artists that we wanted and create a kind of a you know the look and the feel of of uh, of what we wanted this book to be mm -hmm. and bad planet is some is uh something that I'm really proud of. You know, we really worked hard on that book and we weren't worried about how long it was going to take to put it out. We had to find the right artists. We went through uh, three, three artists on, on, on Bad Planet. Um, one guy who didn't make it to the start line, one guy who did an issue and a half before having to fall out, and then we finally got uh, James Daly who really brought the book home and, and made it his own. And, and you know, thank God because I can't imagine the book, you know, in any other kind of form other than that that that, that James Daly look that the book's got. Something about I think guys who like graphic novels, there's something about the art uh, and the the way that a graphic novel looks that that rings a bell inside of you. It turns you on in a way that I can't really put my finger on. But there's something about uh, the art of a book, and there's so many different ways to go, you know. There's the Mobius style, um, which is very kind of uh, light and, and thin and surreal. Um, but, but and, you know, then there's the Frank Frazetta style or the Al Williamson, the old EC comic book <coughs> stuff, which is very realistic but stylized like Wally Wood. You know, and these people give you a visceral feeling when you look at their art. I think some people, and those people end up becoming comic book readers and collectors. Um, but it's very informative in sort of how you view, or at least for me, when, when I read comics as a kid, it, was, it informed my whole worldview about what movies should look like. It, you know, when I read novels, I saw them in different styles of illustrations. Um, it's really uh, influential. Uh, to me as an artist. So creating Raw Studios is a way of kind of con trying to continue that uh, inspiration, you know, for, for, uh, for kids, you know, who, who may maybe wouldn't be able to get the kind of work that we do in, a in, any, other, in a any other place, right, you know. Right. So, Tim, do you think that this visceral experience that Tom refers to, is, is, that, is that what happens to all of us because it takes us back to our childhood? That's typically where most of all of us 
first looked at comic books and saw that kind of art? Yeah, I don't know. Um, I think I think you know, ch talking to people who who experienced it through what you're saying, through through kind of a childhood experience, definitely. Um, but I think that um, it goes far beyond that. Um, if you do good material in a story in in a kind of sequential format, you know, we can we can convert people that have never read comics. You know, mm -hmm. that are that are in their 30s and 40s, that are in their 20s, and may, you know, comics didn't used to be cool when you hit college, right? right. Um, I think it can affect. In, especially today, um, you know, 25, 30 years ago, <laughs> maybe longer now, uh, you know, it was how to draw comics the Marvel way. Yeah. And it was very much, comics were, had a set kind of look. Um, then in came uh, guys like Bill Sienkiewicz and Dave McKean um, and, and Frank Miller, and they kicked the door down uh, as to what was acceptable, like, as a, as a comic story, as, in terms of the artwork. And, it, it opened it up to much more mature, mm -hmm. you know, it was like it was, Marvel Comics went from, from that kind of very, I wouldn't say sterile look, but comparatively somewhat sterile look to, to you know, embracing things that are avant-garde mm -hmm. today. I mean, look at, look at like something like Sienkiewicz's Stray Toasters. <laughs> I mean, that would have never been done 20 years ago. But um, again, you know, it's, it's the, the parallels are, are pretty amazing. You know, it is a lot like the film world. This is two creative outlets, two creative um, uh, places to do what you do. And guys like Wally Wood were the director, the cinematographer, the, the, they wore all the hats. And, and they didn't have a budget. All, their only budget was their time. So mm -hmm. they, could, they could do whatever was in their head, they could pour out on that board. And, I, and that's just magical, yeah. you know? Yeah. It's well, unbridled And creativity. at the same time, you had uh, uh, the underground comics, you know? So you, you had the sort of the, the Silver Age comics and the, the, uh, the stuff that Tim, Tim's talking about, you know, the sort of the sterile superhero Comics. Underground was the first kind of let's let's there there can be other things. Yeah, so they, it, so uh, it does go back further than those they, guys. But. They open the they really sort of blew the door open as to what a comic book c could be, and, and they made them you know they were adults they were adult stories. Some of them were philosophical in nature. You know, of course there are some really raunchy, sexy S underground stories studies. about life in a lot of ways, and but, and you know crumbs, Mr. Natural, you know, right. and and. That's what Tom, you know, like I was in the undergrounds when I was a lot younger, and I was mainly it was Robert Crumb. Um, mm. And one of the things that um, I love about Tom, and one of the things that that you know, Tom turns me on to things uh, that I that I probably wouldn't get into otherwise. Um, but but because Tom is so passionate about what he loves, artists like Kim Deitch, who you know, I'm looking at pretty stuff, and then Kim Deitch does not draw pretty, right? But there's something more there. And Tom, Tom really is, um, you know, he's a creator. He's an artist. You know, it's I think more more so than than an actor at the at the core of that. Hmm. Um, he's a creator, hmm. and whether that's comics or or music or film or or whatever, he's he's uh, he's he's up for any of it. You know, <laughs> it's hmm. it's just in him to get it out. Is he kissing ass or is he talking and, truth? And there? when we t also I turned uh, Tim on to uh, Thomas Ott. Who I guess you'd never uh, seen, you mm -hmm. know. And I'm a big. I look for you know all kinds of sort of different, different stuff, and um, and my tastes are. I try to, I try to get all the food groups in, mm -hmm. you know, and try to sample a little bit of everything. And Thomas Ott was somebody that was very inspirational to me in graphic novels. He does this scratch board style, and. Uh, it's black and white, and usually all of his stories are, um, are wordless. So you'll have a whole graphic novel, and it'll be all all pictures. And the stories had a kind of Twilight Zone esque, sort of Kafka esque uh, tint to them, and they really used to turn me on. And they were very inspirational for the movie that we did, Dark Country. Um, and then after we finished the film, I thought that it would be really interesting to ask Thomas Ott to do a graphic novel of the film. Mm. But instead of doing the film, and, 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 and Thomas hadn't seen the film, I sent him the short story and said, what, what do you think about making a graphic novel out of this short story? This is the short story that we created Dark Country from. So that's sort of taking the short story and, and turning it into a film. What if you took the short story and turned it into a graphic novel? And then we could sort of 
see what, what these two worlds brought, brought about. Well, Thomas was up for that. He hadn't seen the movie. He loved the short story, and, and we got the chance to work together. And we created Dark Country, the graphic novel. Um, the rare opportunity. Which is out, it's out in the comic book shops um, uh, this month. I think it, it comes out in a couple of weeks, so look for it in your comic book shop, uh, Dark Country. It should be debuting in a... Beautiful hardcover volume. In a couple of weeks. Tim, Tim designed the, the whole book, um, and uh, as well as put together the extra section in the book, which is like 30 or 40 pages of behind the scenes stuff. It's Tim's production drawings. It's Bernie Wrightson's character concepts. David Alcock's um, uh, storyboards, and, and um, he did a ton of, of uh, conceptual work on, mm -hmm. the, on, the, on the film. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's chock full of all that and, behind and the And that gives you kind of a, an insight into the sort of the creative process that, uh, that we went through to, to bring this thing to life. And it was really kind of the denouement of the whole Dark Country experience. It mm -hmm. turned out to be a graphic novel, which made perfect sense for us because that's what we do. Mm -hmm. And it was a great way to kind of put a bow on the whole experience, you know, and sort of wrap that up. And, um, I'm re uh, really proud of, of the way the Dark Country graphic novel turned out. Well, this makes Dark Country much more of a franchise now. Your multi-platform, multi-distribution. Well, I, I, I wouldn't call it a franchise. To, but it's getting there. Come on. But it's, it's, it's uh, multiple audiences you're serving. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think the movie is very much a comic book movie. It's not something that I think that mainstream people would really enjoy. But we also didn't really make it for, yeah, for mainstream It's the least people. merchandisable movie that, you know, that was ever we, made. We made an old-fashioned film noir. Yeah. And uh, we got to show it up in San Francisco uh, for the Film Noir Foundation with Eddie Muller. And that was kind of the, that was the, the, the best screening of the film. It was, we played it for the audience that the film was made for. And I w it was really heartening because they, they laughed in all the right places. They really understood it. They got it. They got all the references to the old Film Noir films. And, uh, you know, it, you need stuff like that to kind of get you geared up for the next one. You know, a little bit of a little bit of uh, positive feedback is not a, not a bad thing. Or you know, and regardless of how it played to the general public, because well, it wasn't really released. Uh, I mean, it was it was released to DVD um, with no fanfare. Um, regardless of how it. it, it it was kind of dismissed by the studio. Um, we we were fortunate enough, A, to have that Castro theater screening where it was screened for film noir enthusiasts and they got it and they loved it and it was a standing ovation and it was it went over like unbelievable. But we also have screened it at, at comic shows, mm -hmm. you know, at like the Long Beach Comic Con and to yeah, a room of 400 now. people, comic right. fans, right. fans of Tom's, fans of mine, fans of Raw and comic fans, and, and it absolutely blew them away. And we were able to screen it in 3D. Yeah, which thanks to the uh, 3D uh, Stere society, yeah. the Stereo thanks. Club. Yeah, the Southern California Stereo Club uh, came down and they set up this whole 3D contraption at the convention center in Long Beach. And we did it twice, we did it two years done, in a row. Done it two times. And, and they, and uh, that, that, that's the audience. I mean, they those, loved those it. Guys. Yeah. I mean, these are people that ranged in age from 15 to 45 and there wasn't, everyone was over, just over the moon. And, and that, that is, it, you know, we're, when the studio kind of doesn't get it, that hurts. Yeah, yeah. But when you see how it plays to the people that we made it for, and you see that kind of positive reaction, it's, it's very gratifying. Let me ask you an academic question here for the non-comic book fan. How do you define the difference between a graphic novel and a comic book? Uh, I mean, it's very simple for me. A graphic novel is a self-contained story that is usually, you know, s something that would be at least 48 pages, if not more, um, that was specifically um, released as a single story. Um, comic, it would be, my, my, my comics are, are single issue, 22, 24 pages, maybe a prestige format, you know, double-sized book or something like that, but Graphic novels to me are, and I grew up, you know, right when graphic novels came out, you know, Death of Captain Marvel and, and uh, you know, the, the, the graphic novel term was kind of, to my, to my experience, first coined, um, was right on the cusp of when comics um, were starting to become a, a, you were starting to see more retailers. 
uh, mm -hmm. direct only comics, stuff that the, you couldn't 80s, get on the right. newsstand. In yeah, the 80s. The early 80s. Yeah. And it was spearheaded by Jim Starlin's Death of Captain Marvel and, and Dave Stevens um, doing The Rocketeer and Neil Adams doing Ms. Mystic and uh, Don McGregor and Paul Galassi doing Saber. And this d direct only comics that you could only get in a comic mm -hmm. shop. You couldn't, or you could, I guess you could mail order them, but um, it opened up this new chapter of, of this, this community that we love so much. But, and so graphic novels to me are just, I think it, the, the term is overused a bit today, um, but graphic novels, any story, any complete story that's put out in right. a sequential format. And a comic um, book is a serialized mm -hmm. version of, you know, it's yeah, a well shorter serialized version. You have collect a comic issues. You, you can collect different issues and, you know, you'll collect all the, those issues into a graphic novel right. and that'll be your... That'll be your story. Well, I would call it, you know, it's like, it's even then I wouldn't call that a graphic novel, even though it is. Um, it's just what we call trade paperback. Right. You know, we've yeah. collected it into trade paperback. Graphic novel, to me, is something that didn't come out in any other format but that graphic novel format. Right. Yeah. But, you know, Tim and I, we, I think we're proud of catering to kind of like a, an, uh, an offbeat crowd. Um, we're, uh, and I, I don't know what, what the right term is for that. We're, we're an alternative comic book uh, company. And we're an alternative creative entertainment company, you know. We're always going to make something that's a little bit left of center. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, the, the studios and the, the guys who do the mainstream stuff, they do that really well. And we have no desire to, to compete with that. And the stuff that turned me on as a kid was always stuff that was a little bit left of center. Usually, you know, and that's why I think sci-fi fans are also um, uh, disappointed with a lot of the material that comes out of Hollywood because the sci-fi fan is generally a more intelligent uh, human being. You know, they, they ha they're a little bit broader scope in the imagination department. Um, and, you know, they're smart. And uh, creating stuff, material that these guys are going to respond to is not always easy. You know, you, you have to be clever about, about what you do. And that's why, I, you know, we're proud of the response that Bad Planet's gotten and it continues to get, you know, it's a smart science fiction comic. Yeah, and we, and we have loyal. created a, a, an audience and they do, you know, they, are, they do expect it's a certain kind of audience. stuff from us. And we're really excited about that. We're revamping our website. I just think that comes out in, in a couple of weeks or so. So uh, that'll, be, that'll be fun. Um, so what's the website? It's rawstudios.com. And you can come join our forums and yes. check us out. We keep updates on all our different stuff. And we have a really terrific forum on there, especially the comics and film uh, forum. There's a great discussion on alternative movies and stuff that you maybe haven't seen. You should check it out to get some ideas about some great movies that aren't mainstream. And that's, you know, that's Raw Studios all the that way. The yeah. That's the goal. Awesome. From Hollywood, it's Jeffrey, Tom, Tim, Slice of Sci-Fi. <laughs>